it's a joy, always a joy, especially to be here in this congregation. Appreciate your pastor and his wife and appreciate this congregation very much. And thankful that you keep doing this every year at my birthday. <laughs> they they uh, do this now in honor. This is sort of a memorial for my birthday. My birthday is tomorrow. <laughs> Tuesday, I guess. No, today's Friday. Man, I'm way off. My birthday's Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, you might want to remember that. <laughs> it's a joy, and I, I appreciate Don asking me to be here. I have a familiar text tonight in Romans chapter 11, if you want to turn there with me, and I trust you have your Bibles with you. Romans chapter 11. I want to read the first seven verses. <clears throat> My message tonight is God's answer, God's answer to a troubled prophet. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture says of Elijah, how he made intercessions to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they have digged down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel, natural Israel, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. I want to first remind you about this prophet, and you'll find this account in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 19 for the most part, but this is probably one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. He lived in the days of Ahab, the wicked king of Israel. He was um, Jezebel's husband. We've all heard of Jezebel. This was, was a man that lived during that wicked reign and probably one of the greatest prophets uh, ever lived. And I say that even comparing him to Moses. He was a great prophet. Mighty in word and he was mighty in deed. Anybody that had any sense feared this man. They were scared to death of this man. When he spoke, the fire of heaven may fall on you. One day he went out to the mighty Jordan River and took his mantle in his hand and smote the water and the river just parted. It just parted. He prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three years and six months. He prayed again that it would rain and the heavens gave abundance of rain. He was a mighty prophet. A mighty prophet. Ahazius was the son of Ahab and he hated this prophet. He found out that Elijah was close by Samaria, setting up on a hill. And he sent his captain with 50 soldiers to go and get him. And he walked up to this man of God and said, Man of God, make haste and get down. The king wants to see you. And he said, If I'm a man of God, let heaven, let fire come down from heaven and burn you up. And boy, the fire fell and burned him and his 50 up. Ahasuerus was a very arrogant man. He sent 50 more with their captain. He was a little bolder than the first captain. Went up and said, Oh, man of God, get down now. Come down now. 
He said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and burn you up. And boy, it did. He sent 50 more with their captain. And this captain came up and he fell on his face and said, Oh, man of God, I saw what you did. Have mercy upon me. Let my life be precious and my men be precious in thy sight. And God said, Go with him. He's not going to hurt you. <laughs> He's not going to hurt you. This was a mighty man. Remember Mount Carmel? We all remember Mount Carmel, don't we? Where he faced down 450 prophets of Baal. Faced them down. He said, we're going to see today who God is. There's one God. We're going to ask him to reveal himself. And he told the prophets, he said, you build you an altar, you stack the wood on it, you put your sacrifice on it, then you cry out to your gods. And if he answers you by fire, he'll be God. Well, they did that. They did that. Got their sacrifice, began to cry out. Cried out all morning, nothing happened. Elijah began to mock them. He said, maybe your God is busy. Maybe you should cry a little louder. Or maybe he's talking to somebody. Maybe he's asleep on a journey. He mocked them. And they got so upset they began to cut themselves with their knives and blood gushing out of their, their skin. And the Bible says there was no voice. No voice. No one regarded them. Can't you imagine how frustrated Satan was? That God would not let him move, say anything, do anything. He was over there in the corner pouting as it was. God shut his mouth. And they cried until they finally gave up. They broke the altar down and Elijah repaired the altar and laid his wood on it. Put the sacrifice on it. Had them to bring four barrels of water and soak the sacrifice, soak the wood and fill the ditch up with water. And he called on the God of Israel. And he said, Oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, let it be known today that you're God. You're the God of Israel. And let it be known that I'm your servant and I've done this at your word and that you've turned back the hearts of the people and fire fell from heaven. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You got that kind of power with God. <coughs> Fire fell from heaven, burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stone and the dust, and licked up the water that filled the trenches. They all began to shout, God is God. God is God. This was a great man, wasn't he? He was a great man. What kind of man was he really? When you, when you got down to Elijah himself, what kind of a fellow he was? You know what the Bible says about this man? He was just like you, and he was just like me. He was born in sin, like we are. He lived in sin until God converted him and revealed Jesus Christ to him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And every man where you find him in the New Testament or the Old Testament, he must be born again. Jesus Christ had to be revealed to his heart. He was a sinner. That's all he was. Saved by the grace of God. You know what James tells us about this man? He was subject to lack of passion as you know. In and of himself, he was as physically weak, spiritually weak, as you are, and as I am. And we've got, we've got an illustration of this, an example of this, over in 1 Kings, and you'll have to turn over there and read it at your leisure, 1 Kings 18 and 19, we don't have time to turn over there, Don, if I, I, he won't loan me, he won't yield to any of his time, so I, I got to finish at my time. 
I don't blame him. You remember when he had faced down those 450 prophets? Killed them. He killed them. Took them down to the brook Keshron and, and uh, killed them. Threw their bodies into the, the, the brook. The floods that was coming carried them all the way down to the sea. Nobody ever saw them again. The rains came and he outran the chariot of Ahab back to Jezreel. Ahab went in and told Jezebel, Elijah's killed your prophets. And she sent him a note. A man brought him a note and he opened it up and read it. And he said, Dear Elijah, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like one of my prophets. I'm going to kill you. And you know what he did? He didn't even take time to pack his lunch. Man, he jumped up and ran. Finally left his servant behind. And he ran for over 40 days and ran all the way out of the country to Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's the kind of man he was. I think sometimes God is pleased to take His men, good men, even His prophets, these great men, and humble them by the simplest of means just to prove to you and I that no man is going to say anything or do anything of any consequence except God is working in him and God is working through him. He did the same way with the Apostle Peter, didn't he? Peter's ready to fight. He's ready to die. And just a few minutes later, he denied Jesus Christ because a little maid looked at him and said, You're one of them. You're one of them. No man is anything, and no man can do anything without the power of God, without the grace of God. I wonder, I wonder when these other people heard that he ran. I mean, they had such high respect for him, had such regard for him, and now he's ran out of the country. Maybe these people begin to think, man, he's nothing without God. The Lord leaves him, he's just like us. That's what God wants to teach us. That's what he's teaching us here in this lesson. Boy, you and I have experienced this. Some of us have lived long enough now that we have experience. We can look back. And some of us look back on some of the best preaching that our country has known. You and I have sat under some of the most powerful preaching and the most powerful preachers that I've known in my lifetime. It was though God was speaking to us, wasn't it? And we've watched some of these men as they've gotten older and, and some of them have gotten so feeble that they can't even get into the pulpit to preach to us. Some have gotten so mentally weak that they won't even read or have prayer publicly for the church anymore. They're no use to themselves and no use to us as far as preaching is concerned. And now we look at them. And we've watched them as one by one we've lost them. And then we realize, oh God, it was you speaking. It wasn't their voice I was hearing. You were speaking to me through those men. Don't we remember it? Oh, and their words went to our hearts. And we just couldn't believe it. The power that was there to convert us and deliver us and guide us and edify us. And then we finally realized it wasn't those men at all. They were preaching with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. And oh, when we lose Him, when we lose Him, we may present theological arguments. We may set forth a system of theology. We may even set forth plain truth. But I tell you, without preaching in the Holy Spirit, it won't have any power to it. 
That's what God is teaching us from this prophet. We're all just like him, aren't we? We can't do anything without Jesus Christ our Lord. We can't preach and you can't hear. And none of us can believe. And none of us can repent. We can't even sing or desire or shed a tear. We can't do anything without Him. We're just like this scared prophet. We'll run and hide. We see something else in this man. We see the danger. Sometimes it afflicts good men, gracious men, in becoming full of themselves. Full in themselves. Our text tells us here, I am left alone. And that's where you can go back to 1 Kings 19 where Paul quoted this from. I am left alone. And... He was alone. He was alone. And the Lord uh, asked him. He had fled to Mount Sinai there in the cave. And the Lord asked him, where are you, Elijah? And he said, uh, I, I only am left. I, I only am left. And I've been so zealous. I've been so zealous for my Lord. Israel has broken your covenant and turn to false idols and worship them and I am left alone and then a whirlwind came and the fire came and the rocks rent and the Lord asked him that same question again where are you Elijah? I'm left alone I'm here by myself I'm the only one that's faithful I'm the only one that hasn't compromised Everybody else, nobody else but me left. Nobody. I am left alone. I only. I, I, I. When we start getting a lot of those eyes in there, it, we're in trouble, aren't we? Yes, we are. Would you think a man of this caliber could get in this attitude? I am left alone. I don't know if there's anything to this. The Holy Spirit leaves out only here and it just says in our text, I am. I am. We know where that comes from, don't we? That's God. That's the word Jesus Christ Himself said. I am. And here He's saying, I am. I'm left alone. I only remain. Elijah, have you ever heard of a man with the name of Obadiah? Uh, I'm not for sure. Yeah, you're not for sure. Yeah. You're so caught up in yourself. You're so busy with your ministry. You don't know about a, a man that serves in Ahab's court that hid 100 of the Lord's prophet and he risked his life to do it. You don't know him? Do you know those 100 prophets? I'm left alone. Ain't nobody faithful, faithful but me. I am so zealous. Did you ever get that way, Donnie Bell? <laughs> Everybody got that way. You don't have to be a preacher to get that way. Just let the Lord bless your message. And before you get out of the pulpit, you'll be thinking, man, what a message. Who was that? Was it Spurgeon that somebody complimented him on the message when he left the pulpit? He said, what a great message. And he said, I was already told that while I was in the pulpit. <laughs> we tell ourselves that, don't we? Man, what a message. Look what I'm doing. Ain't nobody doing what I'm doing. Somebody said, if the Lord's going to bless us with His right hand, He's going to have to keep us beat down with His left. That's just the way we are. Paul was caught up into the third heaven. That great apostle of the Gentile. Saw things that he couldn't even utter. God showed him abundance of things by revelation. And he come back down and he was just ready to get lifted up in pride and start saying, I, I, I. 
And God sent a messenger of Satan to afflict him, a thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. Every time I see a young preacher that says to me, uh, God's called me to preach. The first thing I say to him, man, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> if God's going to use anybody, He's going to beat him down. He's going to keep him low. You ain't worth nothing if he don't. I remember a few years ago, I was talking to Brother Todd, and I told him, I said, boy, I'm just so nervous. I just, I'm nervous when I'm making preparations to go to the pulpit, and, and I'm nervous while I'm preaching, and this just, just, just kills me. And he said, Bruce, you're taking yourself away too serious. I was. <laughs> Wasn't taking the ministry too serious, but myself. A lot of this is pride, isn't it? Yeah. I want to have liberty to preach. If I feel good about my message, that's all that matters. <laughs> I was reading a book, a, a, a pastor wrote, I think he's dead now, and he said, he talked about the Lord. He said, the Lord humbled me. He brought me low and humbled me. <laughs> And he said, I'm so thankful that he did because he brought me to the place where I didn't need for somebody to come up and say, Pastor, good message. Pastor, great message. He said, I realized it wasn't about me. It was about those I was preaching to. <coughs> Is it edifying them? Is it helping them? Lord, I am left alone. Ain't nobody doing anything but me. The third thing about this prophet, and I guess it just naturally reached this point. I'm alone. I'm alone. Naturally. Naturally you're alone. Ain't nobody as faithful as you are. Nobody doing as much as you are. Nobody's so committed as you are. You've separated yourself from everybody. I tell you, when we get that way, we get lonely, don't we? You know, I can probably do without the church. I can probably get through this, this world without the body of Christ. I just don't know how. Yeah. We're, a, we're a body, aren't we? We're the body of Christ, the Bible teaches us. You're members of His body. His hands, his, his feet, His ears, His eyes. You separate your hand from your arm, and what happens to it? It'll swivel up. It'll turn blue. It's useless. Remove your foot from your leg. No foot isn't going to do anything but lay there. We're members one of another. We're in the body of Christ. And I tell you what, if we separate ourselves from that body, if we don't stay in the communion of the saints, I'd say you better get your depression medication prescription filled because you're probably going to need it. You're probably going to wind up just like this fella. I'm alone. I'm alone. Why are you alone? There's 7,000 prophets out there. That's not compromise. Why are you alone? You know the Lord didn't save His people so they could separate themselves from <coughs> His people. He never does that, does He? One of the phrases you'll see in the New Testament, or its equivalent, is always phrases like this. Upon the first day of the week, they assemble together. Together. You never see them out there with themselves. Now let me stop and say, I know, I know there's people in places in this country and in the world that it's impossible for them to gather. I know that. I realize that. The providence of God has shut them up out there. Are people sick at home? 
But I'm saying, brothers and sisters, this. If you're just running everywhere, and if you meet with the body of Christ okay, and if you don't okay, then you're going to get yourself in trouble if you're a child of God. Together. Even our Lord Jesus Christ never spent His time alone, did He? He surrounded Himself with His apostles and His, His people. And He was only alone when He come to the end. And He had to be alone there upon the cross. You know what the Bible says? When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, we're going to be caught up together. We're going to be glorified together. Everything's together. Don't separate yourself, dear soul. Every time the body of Christ meets, if you can, meet with them. And you won't experience what this man of God experienced here. I'm alone. I'm alone. Now, let's go for just a few minutes to God's answer. Here's God's answer to this prophet. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the image, bowed their knee to the image of Baal. Paul is speaking here of God's electing a remnant among the Jewish nation here in chapter 11. He elects a remnant among the natural Jews. That's who he's speaking about here, but he does that among the Gentiles. He's got his elect among the natural Jews and elect among the Gentiles. And the Lord saves his elect among the natural Jews and among the Gentiles and he brings them together in Christ and he calls them the Israel of God. And in Elijah's day there was a remnant of Jews according to the election of grace. All the way back in Elijah's day. And Paul said at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And I would say probably we could just figure today there's a remnant of natural Jews according to the election of grace. You talk to the typical fundamental Baptist pastor and you mention election to him and he'll get red in his face. And yet he'll turn right around and say, well, we need to make sure Israel is preserved. God's beat you to it, bud. Yeah. <laughs> He's already preserving that people. Yeah. Why? He's got a remnant among them. There would be no natural Jew at all if it wasn't for election. Why does the Jew still exist as a people? Because of election. God is reserving to Himself a remnant. I love the definition that the Holy Spirit here gives of election. If you had to tell somebody what, is, what election is, right here is a perfect definition. In verse 4, here's the definition of election. I have reserved to myself. <laughs> That's election, isn't it? God reserving to Himself. I love to use my imagination sometimes. I try, to, I try to, you know, stay in the Scriptures with it. You know what the Scripture teaches about the elect of God? That their names were in a book. The Lamb's Book of Life put there before the world began. And I love sometimes to imagine that, that I can go back to the foundation of the world and just dive right off back into eternity. And just sail and sail and sail back into eternity all the way back there to the beginning and I see in the Lord's hand a book and the title of that book is the Lamb's Book of Life and there sits the Lord writing names in and I say Lord what are you writing I'm writing names I'm writing names I know something Bruce that you don't know I know sin's going to enter I know a fall is coming I know what's going to happen. Devastation. I know hell is going to enlarge itself. <clears throat> Humanity's ruined. I know it. And what am I doing by writing these names down? 
I'm reserving to myself. That's what election is. Remember old J.D. Ward, what he used to say? If God had not a chose some, heaven would have had none. Ain't that the truth? If God had not a reserve to Himself, there'd be no heaven. You see the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and what's He doing? It's almost impossible to explain what He's doing there apart from election. Isn't it? Because what He's doing there is securing the elect. He's laying down His life for the sheep. He's saving His people from their sin. Take away election. And how do you explain the cross? Here's the Holy Spirit at work in hearts. Working in men's hearts. And what's He doing there? What's the Holy Spirit doing in men's hearts? In the hearts of sinners today? It's difficult to explain it apart from election. He's making His people willing. His people willing in the day of His power. He's teaching them to come to Christ. How do you explain the work of the Holy Spirit apart from election? How do we explain heaven apart from election? Take away heaven. And there's, take away election and there's no need for heaven. God don't need heaven. He's too big for it anyway. Who's heaven for? I saw much people in heaven. It's for people. You take away people and you don't need heaven. And you take away election, you don't have people. Without election, there's no heaven and there's no earth. It's not needed. Election necessitates these things. Look out into eternity. And there you see a multitude that no man can number around the throne worshiping the Lamb of God. And they're singing to Him and they're shouting to Him and they're dancing and leaping in their garments of white. And somebody says, what is this place? This is the place God has made for those He reserved for Himself. Take away election, you don't have heaven. Take away election, you don't have a kingdom. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Take away the you, and you take away the kingdom. And you take away election, you take away you. We can't talk about the existence and preservation of anything apart from election. Why is there a world? Why does the sun come up and the rain come down? Why is there fruitful seasons? Why is hearts filled with gladness? Why are there nations? Why are languages and tribes preserved? Why are families preserved? <coughs> Explain this apart from election. And you can't. Because all of these things exist for the elect. There is no families if there's no election. There is no language. There is no nations if there's no election. Explain why you've got a group of people in this world in every age that believe God and believe in the Son of God and they love Him and they love one another and they serve one another. I look out at some of you, I think of some of you so often and remember some of the trials that you've gone through and sometimes when I think I'm in a great trial, I remember what some of you have gone through and it encourages me because I say that's nothing to what they went through. And some of you have been on the way decade after decade after decade 
And you've been faithful ever since I've known you. And why? How in the world can this be explained apart from an election? I cannot explain your faithfulness to the Lord and your upholding His worship publicly and privately any more than you can explain why these 7,000 men didn't bow to the image of Baal apart from an election. Why do we have faithful saints? Because God has reserved them to Himself. That's it, isn't it? You go to these 7,000 men and you say, why haven't you bowed? And they wouldn't have said, well, I pray a lot. Man, I, I pray a lot. You just don't know how much I pray. And I read, man, I read several chapters a day. I'm faithful. You know what they would have said? The same thing you say. God reserved me to Himself. That's why I've not bowed. That's why I'm not thrown in the towel. That's why I keep on keeping on. That's why in dear hardness as a good soldier, God has reserved me to Himself. And you take away election, you don't have any faithfulness in the church. If there's no election, there's nothing. There's no Paul. There's no Apollos, there's no Cephas, there's no world, there's no life, there's no death, there's no death of Christ, there's no death that releases us and let us go home. Because all of these things belong to the election of grace. And let's narrow it right down to this, brothers and sisters. This is how you and I feel about God's election. If there's no election, there's no Christ. How do you feel about that? He belongs to the elect. And the elect belong to Him. Take away election, there's no Christ. That's how serious we are about this. Does this answer any of your problems that you have? Next time you get lifted up in pride, go right here. Ain't nobody doing what I'm doing, boy. Oh, yes, he's reserved to himself 7,000. There was a marked difference in this prophet when the Lord told him that. You see a marked difference in his life. He never was alone again. When the Lord told him, I've reserved to myself 7,000, the first thing he did is went and found one of them and fellowship with him the rest of his life. And he was among the prophets. They knew when he was going to be taken up. Oh, this will do something to your pride, won't it? I've reserved it myself. This will answer your question maybe about the doubts of your own salvation. I don't know how many people come up to me and say, Bruce, I'm so doubtful of my salvation. You know what I tell people anymore? I said, you're probably doubtful that anybody's going to be saved. You're probably doubtful of salvation itself. Nobody's, not even the apostles or the prophets going to, to be saved and go to heaven. This doubting of our salvation sometimes goes deeper than we think. It's doubting the whole scheme of salvation. The Lord ain't saving anybody. Well, this answers that. If there's election, then there's salvation. And there's people in heaven. Yes, there is salvation. There is. Well, the church, the church is going to be so diminished, nobody left. I beg your pardon. At this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. No sense witnessing to the lost people. Lord ain't saving anybody. I beg your pardon. At this present time. As far as I know, the Bible teaches every generation the Lord has His people. And He's saving them. He's saving them. I have reserved to myself. Would anybody dare to dictate to God who he can reserve to himself? Would any man be so presumptuous to tell him who he can choose and who he can't? And boy, he's, he reserves some strange ones, doesn't he? 
a widow woman starving to death? Hmm. A leopard, a heathen general that was a leper? He was one that God reserved himself. A thief on a cross in his dying hours. It was manifested. I reserved him to myself. A bunch of ignorant and unlearned fishermen. He reserved him to himself. What if he's reserved you? What if he reserved me? Oh. Oh, if he's reserved you to himself. Your eternal destiny is sealed. And the Holy Spirit will make sure of it. You're coming to Christ. You're believing on Christ. You're cleaving on Christ. You ain't going to let Him go. God has reserved you to that end. Oh, if He's reserved you to Himself, happy you and happy me if I'm one of them. Reckon you are? I tell you the only way I know. You're just cleaving to the Son of God. You've renounced every other hope, every other way. You've renounced salvation and you're cleaving to the Son of God to be saved by Him. Right. If you're doing that, dear soul, God has reserved you to Himself. And I did not take a minute of your time. <laughs> I love Don Fortner. And let me say this. Let me, let me give a plug for one of his books before I sit down. If you don't have the book going home, and I think that's your last one, that's the best he's ever did. He's got some good ones, but that's the best. If you don't have going home, you need to get that book. If you can't afford it, he'll give it to you. But if you can't afford it, <laughs> listen, listen, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. But if you can't afford it and a little more, you make up for the one he gave to the other person. Okay? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor.